really extreme, but whatever everyone's feeling. <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Bria. I'm one of the board members, student board members of March for Our Lives, which we're doing a coalition with the Remix Project and also March for Our Lives today. Um, I'm so excited to have you guys all here with us um, to talk about visual art representation and how we like incorporate healing and actually, you know, want to have like a creative expression and let people know like what we're doing with our healing process, but also doing it our own unique way. Um, so we wanted to create a remix and have like a conversation where we invite you guys to heal with us because we know everyone's healing is, is their own. It's very fluid. It's very perspective. It's everyone's like own individual healing. And we wanted to bring creatives on this conversation to talk about their own healing processes and what that looks like for like creating anything, whether it's music or fashion or monologue, um, a script, uh, if it's a visual art piece, if it's graphic design, things like that bringing everyone together, creatively talking about healing, um, shifting the conversation around activism, because not everyone you know, can put on a tie, wear a tux, and speak to thousands of people and talk about policy. But how else are you ever to like, shift the conversation and promote activism, but in your own type of way, your own type of healing? And so that's kind of what like remixes and like how we're trying to shift that culture of healing in March for Our Lives and inviting like new exposure of creatives into this space, like making a healing space for everyone. Yeah, hi, my name is Vickiana Pizzitom. I'm one of the regional organizing directors for March for Our Lives and uh, worked on this project with Bria. And so we're, we're really happy to see everyone here. And, you know, another reason why we really wanted to have Remix is to really engage in shifting the culture um, and that's what we really believe all of these artists are doing, um, shifting the, art, the culture and um, shifting the current uh, way of seeing the world through their art um, and through um, um, their artistic vision. And so we're happy to be able to have these conversations with them. Um, you know, we're engaged in a lot of advocacy work. And yes, we do the policy work. We do the talking with the legislators and politicians, but we realize that that is not the only way we're gonna bring about change, um, especially the change that um, saves thousands and thousands of lives every um, year. Um, we really have to go into um, just how we, people are thinking about these issues that we're talking about, about peace, about equity, about justice. Um, and we can only do that by engaging and, and shifting the culture um, through influencing the music that uh, people are listening to, to, the shows that they're watching, the books that we're reading. Um, and so Remix is a part of that. And thank you for joining and sharing that space with us. That's cool. Yeah, so we have our, our, um, our theme. And actually, I want to shout Matthew out. He actually created the, the, uh, the, the design for it and the representation for it. Literally, I would text him like, Matthew, um, can you create this real quick? And he's like on it, literally just brilliancy. I can't even explain it. But um, yeah, so the things that, that we want Remix to do is to one, culturally redefine activism, like we said before. Everyone is their own cultural entrepreneur. Everyone's their own representation and their own uh, reflection of themselves. No one can speak for you unless you are speaking for yourself. And we don't want to like take any words out of any people's mouths. Um, and second is allowing creative exposure to activists. Like we live in a new time where digital era is like literally letting a lot of people come into these spaces and get notoriety and gain attention. But a lot of times you see a lot of like marginalized uh, activists or marginalized creatives who do not have the same platform, people who aren't getting the same, uh, you know, exposure and aren't invited to expansive conversations that they should be invited to. Um, number three is to strengthen the artistic conversation behind political advocacy. Um, we all know what we need to do in November. We all know what we need to do for the next couple of months and how we're really pushing political advocacy, but not everyone is on the same energy wave wavelength or in the same mindset to, you know, always be voting or doing other things, but maybe painting a picture or creating a song or making a script is how they're able to participate in our democracy and be, you know, a political advocates of themselves. And in March for Our Lives, we wanted to really shift that culture of what political advocacy means. It's not always you know like signing something on a ballot but it's having conversations like this and I can't stress that enough because literally we're doing our duty as you know um, people who are upset about things or not even that people who have a, a voice and want to like give voice to power and coming into these spaces and redefining what that means for us 
Yeah, I I think. Uh, can you hear me? Uh huh. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I I am so happy that I see this um, happening. Um, I I I think that um, art it's a way of communicate uh, what we think and what we want, and uh, but not only we we communicate but we also demand for things. Um, in in my particular case, uh, I don't feel any better when I paint. Okay, uh, and I was listening to you at the very beginning um, how the healing process uh, could work uh, through art. Um, not for me. I have other ways of, uh, uh, to feel better. Okay, I work on my motorcycle. I I uh, I do things that are not um, targeted to what uh, fighting gun violence means to me. So otherwise I will be painting murals every single day just to feel better. Um, but what I do know is that I, the final goal is to make people feel better, to make people understand that we can do more than just draw a pretty face on a wall. We can make statements. And this is when art and activism turn into artivism. And that is such a cool discovery, it's such a great work, because not everyone can apply that uh, method to the, the whole story about gun violence. And, and that is also the new thing. Uh, gun violence is not new. Gun violence is not since my son Joaquin was shut down. Um, it's been decades with a gun culture in this country that will, will, won't listen to us. But now they are listening to us. Between other things, we are writing big letters, uh, huge drawings of phases and demands and, and, and real graphic fighting, I will say. And, and it's expanding. So for me, I've been two years without stopping, finding uh, big enough places to, to set and to place Joaquin's statements. It's the only way for him to keep on fighting. So, um, and that is an ability that you can only find through art. Because they might think that we're fucked up and crazy, and maybe we are, but guess what? We could get away with it because I'm an artist. So, so anybody that criticizes me, you better be ready to have a debate with a fucked up uh, uh, artist that has no limits. And that's the beauty of art. So I'm so glad that I see this expanding inside March for All Lives, which is the only, the only movement that I'm sure will solve this problem. I am absolutely convinced about that. This is not a political problem. This is, this needs politicians, but this is a social problem. And we represent society. So um, anyways, I'm happy to be here and I'm, and I'm honored to be, to be here with all these young people uh, teaching me how to do things. And I love it. I can't wait to hear what you guys are doing. Awesome, thank you so much, Manny. Um, and if you could go to the next part, but yeah. And so this is the visual art um, uh, conversation. So last uh, two weeks ago, we had our first remix conversation and that was focused on music. Um, and we were able to bring panelists um, and young musicians from all over the country to talk about how they use um, music to um, heal themselves for some of them, but um, kind of like you mentioned, M Manny, um, it might not be for yourself um, that music is healing or that your art is healing, but it might be more about healing your community um, and spreading that um, love and spreading your messages. Um, and that's also really, really important. And then having those two conversations is important and we hope to have it in this space. Um, and so we kind of want to move into introducing some of these artists and um, people that we're going to have these amazing conversations with. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to start off. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, your name, uh, where you're, where you are right now, where your home base is, 
and um, uh, your pronouns and something fun that people should know about you. Okay, hi, my name is India Griffin. Um, I use uh, the She Series. I am currently in San Diego. We'll be moving to LA soon. Um, and I think something that's, uh, I guess, interesting about me is that I see myself more so than even an artist as a storyteller. Um, and I feel like that allows me and helps me to make my activism or any work that I engage in um, translate across many mediums. All right, if she's not present, we can just go to the next slide. Hi, um, my name is Imani Giverts, and I am currently in Nashville, Tennessee, quarantining at home. Um, I use the She Series, and something interesting about me is that uh, my main source of photography and art is actually through music photography. So I love the fact that you guys brought in um, musicians last time and could talk about healing through that. Um, I love capturing healing through music as well. So that's pretty fun. Um, yeah, I'm just very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, I am Gracie Peckrell. Uh, I'm based out of Southern California and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I think something interesting about me, I mean, I really, I've always known that I wanted to pursue art and that, you know, art has always been present in my life and I wasn't exactly sure how that would manifest itself. And when activism kind of found me, um, you know, I, I didn't know if I would go the route of like fashion design or music for, you know, art related to music. And I feel like I truly found my purpose in activism when activism found me. And it's unfortunate that I was introduced to the movement of gun violence prevention because so many people don't need to be introduced and it's something always present, but I am just so grateful um, I'm honored to be here and I'm grateful for all the amazing people that I've gotten to meet and work with. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be here. Hi, I'm Robin Moxke. I'm Stockbridge Monkey Kamansi and I'm currently based in Portland. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And with art, it was never something that I thought that I did. It was one of the, because I, I didn't, I don't know, when I hear artists, I don't necessarily think of people like me, but it was interesting because it was a way to get my activism sort of out there and to get people talking about stuff, which is the core of activism. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Atuka Berry, uh, pronouns they, them, preferably. I'm based in Boston. And um, I think something interesting about my practice that I feel like has transformed over time is how it's related to my work as an educator. Um, I do edu education work um, at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Boston. Um, and my practice as an artist informs a lot of the decisions and activities and things that I create as an educator and my practice as an educator has definitely transformed my practice as an artist. So I feel like um, now we're moving forward in a time where a lot of creators are now becoming mentors to a lot of people and what they want their creative practice to look like. And I've always been fascinated with that as I have started to like look at alternative ways of learning, things like that. Andrew's not present, we can move forward then. Hi everybody, um, I am Matthew Hogan-Miller. Um, I'm the social media manager with March for Our Lives. 
Um, I'm based in Austin, Texas, and I use he, him. Um, I originally, like, I'm a senior in high school. I was originally looking to go to school for an art degree, and all of a sudden, this full-time job kind of fell into my lap. Um, and largely, I think it was because I was using my art to create things that were in the advocacy realm, but more importantly, I was using it um, to heal from my own trauma. Um, and I think by using art and by using art to find hope in myself, it was also a way to um, hopefully help others heal and hopefully help others find hope. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to be talking to all of you. And I'm so happy that Vickiana and Bria have started this project. Well, I, I guess I skipped the rules because I said everything at the beginning. Um, my name is Manuel Oliver, and I uh, lost my beautiful son, Joaquin, uh, during the Portland shooting. And um, that was on February 14th. I had a great job. I, I was living the American dream. And on February 15th, I quit my job and I started um, Change the Ref, uh, which is basically a movement of art that um, tries to change the, the narrative of gun violence. So I, I know most of you, um, I, I've seen your work. Um, I can say that Gracie, she never mentioned that she's probably the most talented artist that I ever met. Uh, she's incredible and you know that. Um, so we're in good hands, I guess that's what I wanna say. And um, when I say that I feel honored to be here, it's um, probably I'm, I'm feeling a space that um, Joaquin filled for me. Uh, you guys, without knowing, also do that. And that's healing. That feels good. For sure. I know we also have a conversation. We have a couple of like artist photos and artists like um, drawings and just visuals that we want to give you guys like the full conversations, just discuss, ask each other questions, like get to know each other's healing process, but just to gauge everyone's like perspective and just where you're coming from and like coming together for this like intersectional, uh, intersectional conversation. Me and uh, Vicky, we wanted to just ask you guys a couple of questions about like, what does peace mean for you? Peace in your community um, and just peace in your art and your creation and things that you produce. Like what is, what, what gives you that peace? Like once you finally finish a, an artwork, um, a visual design, things like that. And if, even if you don't complete it, like what brings you that peace? Um, and so we also for Zoom, since we're in a weird type of space, once you finish and answer um, your answer, you can just throw it to someone else who hasn't said anything. So I have Matthew next to me, so I'm just gonna throw the question answer to you. I, I think personally, I find peace in my work um, through the creation of it, not necessarily when it's finished. Um, a lot of what I do is um, in my work is in the creation, I am kind of laying out my emotions in that moment and laying out what I'm feeling as creating it. And that's kind of what drives um, my artwork forward. Um, so I'm a senior in high school, so I don't have as much time on my hands to create um, beautiful pieces all the time. But um, some of the pieces I have created are a series of works um, that explore where my peers found hope and where I found hope. Um, and so in the creation of those pieces, um, essentially I, I kind of went through a whole year of these and I was laying out my emotions throughout the year. So um, in trauma, I was in this really dark place. So I laid out my emotions on the piece. Um, and I think I didn't find peace in that work. I, I in fact, feel, feel unattached to it and I don't like it because it represents a place in my life that I didn't like. Um, but as I got further and further into the series um, and exploring hope and opening up light and taking away that darkness, um, I started to enjoy what I was doing and find peace. And I think a lot of, for a lot of artists, I think, and I won't speak for everybody here, but I think 
personally, I find peace in the process and I find peace in being able to explore myself through my work. Um, okay, that's my answer. So I'm gonna pass it off to the next person on my screen, which is Gracie. Um, I guess um, for me, and this has been kind of a reoccurring theme for me, uh, how I find peace is when I familiar, familiarize myself with somebody else's story. And I feel like that was my introduction to gun violence prevention was I drew the portraits of all the Parkland victims. And I didn't, you know, think about what would happen after that. The primary reason I wanted to do that is because I felt like there were so many names that I didn't know that I couldn't stand to continue like that and not be familiar with these stories of who I found to be the most beautiful, amazing people that I, I can't imagine not knowing about them. And, you know, it was through that I don't think peace is necessarily good and happy feelings because there were a lot of tears there. And, you know, I didn't, it wasn't just positivity and hope, but I feel like peace was, you know, holding those names in my heart and, and knowing, you know, knowing those stories. And I think peace in my community, one of the things that I did, um, I was a Giffords Courage Fellow and as a part of that fellowship, we had to do some sort of project in our communities. And so I decided to do a workshop um, in East Los Angeles, an art workshop um, with um, a couple different amazing artists that I love so much. And it was for survivors and families affected by gun violence because in my personal experience, art, you know, trauma needs art to, you know, to, he not necessarily heal, but it's just so necessary. And I, um, one of the families that came, their son was murdered just two months prior to them coming to this. And, you know, they left, it was about 10 members of that family and they all left wearing flower crowns and having created the most beautiful art. And I feel like so often we view art as such an isolating thing. Like we do our art and then we share it but art can be done together. Art is unifying. And I think that's one thing that Manny does so well is bringing people, bringing communities together through art and, you know, being together. Um, so that's one thing that I would like to continue and work more on is how to unify people through art. I guess I will pass it off to Robin. Hey. As far as finding peace through art, for me, it was, I think coming from a lot of our cultural values have been passed on, but a lot of them are stemming from this historical trauma that we face and we still continue to face this marginalization and understanding that, because there's a lot of what we've gone through as indigenous people has like fractured the community. So some of the stuff I would do, again, I was never, I never had this concept that it was art. It was more just like, how can we get people talking about something and aware of something? We can build something together. So sometimes it would start off as something silly, like there was um, one of my favorite projects was working on just trying to make the biggest fry bread in the world. Um, and it was like 300 pounds, but we had to, that means you have to weld, uh, your own frying pan, you have to get community members together. And it also has to start a discussion about why is fry bread one of our foods when that was originally not something that came from us and it was part of this marginalization that contributed to it. And so as to echo what Matthew said, it's through the process of creating this, this sort of, it's hard to say it's a piece, but creating these things that are visual, you, you meet community, you see unity, you see people expressing themselves and resilience has often been something that indigenous people were thought of as like, we have these stereotypes of stoic and serious and strong. And a lot of that stems from, again, historical trauma where we didn't want to, we couldn't express ourselves or if we did, we were giving into what 
outsiders wanted. And so us creating our own art and creating things together, I think we're talking about stuff and we're expressing ourselves and it's definitely in that process. Um, and it's helped me understand my roots in my community better instead of just being angry. And so I'm gonna go next to me, um, which would be Amani. Awesome. Um, wow, peace for me through art it is a very, it's a very fascinating thing. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily when it's done. I wouldn't necessarily say it's when it's being created, but um, maybe it is through all of those things. I think for me personally, if I can give something back to someone who might be feeling numb or might be feeling, not knowing what they're feeling, but then they can see something that I've created um, and it just provokes any type of emotion. I feel like that is, I loved what Gracie said when, it, when she said um, that peace isn't necessarily a happy feeling, uh, but for me, it's mostly like a deep breath. So if I can give someone something, their art piece or create something that makes someone feel something that provokes a deep breath within them, then it provokes a deep breath within me. And I think through activism, um, the misconception that it is something that is loud and angry and um, earth shaking, which it can be in a righteous sense. It is a deep breath. It comes from the place of, of using our voices and using our visual talents or using whatever we have to um, to tell a story, to create a narrative, to bring people together through any of the feelings that could have been, you know, anger, sadness, pain, loss, um, hope, all into the, the space of peace. So for me through art, that's how I can show it. That's how I can give um, a voice to those who have lost theirs. And so I personally feel that peace is a deep breath that can be felt through something hopefully that I can create and someone can see. And the person next to me is India. So I'm gonna pass that over to you. Um, so I think the way that art kind of brings me peace is that um, often when I'm about to create an art piece or I've been kind of like contemplating a concept for a while. So I've been thinking like, uh, about a person or about a phenomenon or uh, a concept um, for a while. And then it kind of, you know, it kind of expresses itself through this like final art piece and the iterations that it goes through. I think one of the most recent art pieces that I've created that has really like had a, a, an amazing impact on me um, was I created this portrait of Ahmaud Arbery um, and I think portraiture is like one of my, my favorite ways to express myself through art. Um, and what really stood out about that experience was um, when you're drawing someone, you have to look at them for like a long time and you have to kind of imagine all of the different like facets of their personhood and the experiences that they've had um, throughout their life. And, and uh, you have to like, the particular way that I was I was drawing it is that I like use a picker tool for like from like um, Illustrator to like choose the different colors for each part of his skin, um, and I um, like I use I'm I'm really new to Illustrator, so I don't know the exact words, but I used like the pen tool and created like kind of uh, um, like different shapes for each part of his face, and so it was a really like intimate process of of creating portraiture. Um, and I think that really brings to front the front of your mind, like the humanity that we exists within each person. Um, I'm always hesitant to say something like um, kind of giving people humanity, like through art or um, like showing people's humanity through art, because I, I don't think that any, any one of us has the power to give or show anyone's humanity because we, I mean, we don't help hold that power over anyone. Um, but I think that it really helped me connect to the humanness in, in Ahmaud Arbery, even uh, after his death. 
um, his murder. Um, and yeah, I think so uh, kind of reconciling um, our interconnectedness as all people is a very healing process. Um, and then also uh, to accompany that piece of art, I wrote a poem about um, Ahmaud Arbery um, and I did it to kind of express through words the things that I had been thinking as I um, created that portrait. Um, and I really wanted to highlight some of the, the most intimate parts that, that you really don't think about when you think about a person, unless you like know them. Um, so I talked about his smile and his eyes and um, thought about the process of running like in, in a, an open area. Like what does it feel like to be that free to be running? Um, and I think that was definitely a healing process to just think about sensory and think about emotion and personhood um, is, is a healing process for me. And I don't, I don't see anyone on my screen because I'm on my phone, but if somebody wants to go and they haven't gone, sorry, I can't like pass it directly. Well, I can, I, can I, um, I, after listening to all of you, I, I just realized that I am not looking for peace um, when I do my work and I'm okay with that. I'm, I, I really am not trying to feel better as I said at the very beginning. Um, I think that we, this is not about us and, and maybe that was not the plan that you had when you started enjoying painting and, and even the theater or whatever, whatever you do, that was not the plan. But now you are part of a group of people that has a talent that it's in some way uh, helping a whole society. So this is like the mafia. Once you're in, you can't get out because we're counting on you. So when I said that it's not about us, it's, it's not. It's not about Manny or Gracie or Matthew. This is about what we do every single day. How do we engage people? If that makes us feel better as a big picture that it should, then great. But and the, mo the moment that we do this for ourselves, we won't have the same power to convince, to, to impact people. And, and at the very beginning, when you were saying that some people will wear a tie and talk to police, I agree with that. Yeah, I hate ties. I have a few. I never wear them. Um, and I always say that this, through art, you can impact people instead of convincing people. And, and in, in terms of time, one thing is so fast and effective. With a graphic, you can, you can make someone change its mind. Or you have enough time to spend a whole day talking to a group of politicians that really don't care that much about your message. Well, I know Shanti, you joined us a little late. Right now we're just doing a couple of like, answering a couple of questions. If you wanted to just do an introduction, um, where you're from, your pronouns, so we can respectfully identify you. And um, we're answering the question, what does peace mean in your artwork? What does peace mean in your, um, your healing process for creating your art projects? And like, what does peace and your community look like? Yeah, um, I, first of all, I apologize for joining late. I was having a hard time um, with the Zoom link, um, but I'm Chanti, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm Osage and Masawa and I'm from, well, I live in Oregon. Um, and then for peace, I think it depends on the, the piece, I guess. Um, and I agree with what I forgot who it was because I was kind of switching between watching on YouTube and like joining the Zoom. Um, but about portraiture and like staring at someone's face for hours and how much you kind of have to get to know that person. Um, and I also think something that's interesting with like portraiture is that even just like changing the proportions of someone's face a little bit can make it not quite them anymore 
so I think that takes like a really long time to just like make sure that they are like capturing the essence of them, I guess. Um, and I think I have to make sure a lot of the time that I am finding peace when I'm drawing, um, especially since I like started taking commissions or orders and stuff, it's sometimes hard to make sure to like slow down and remember to do things with care and I guess like not rush myself with things. Um, and maybe that's like a little bit of a different um, take on the question than some of the other stuff, which was more about like community care. Um, but yeah. And then for those who haven't answered yet. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Mexico, you can. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that thank you was from someone. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess in the topic of peace, um, I agree with a lot of the things that people pointed out with like, the complexities around what peace even means. And um, I guess in my practice, because I do search around um, a lot of the things that with through my experience, I guess, as like a, a black individual in, in the art world and just in life, um, there are certain aspects of peace that like a lot of us are very unfamiliar with and are very uncomfortable with. Um, it's, it, it does feel like sometimes a privilege to be able to imagine some of the things and, or emotions that would come out of feeling peace or, or experiencing peace. Um, and through my artwork, I feel like I'm unpacking a lot of the things that I, I don't realize are there until I see them mimicked in my communities. Um, uh, and that goes for a lot of the conversations around generational trauma. Like sometimes you don't really realize that like, wounds have been planted in there before you were even born that you are now starting to understand and um, looking for resources to explore. Um, and I think in that journey, like you can see in the country that we live in, there's a lot of gaslighting that happens. There's a lot of moments where you don't even believe that your pain is a real thing because other people don't believe it's real. Um, and I, I guess like that causes a lot of angst and a lot of anguish in a lot of people for a long time. Um, and so I guess I, I, when I do make the art that I make, um, initially it's a release for me that turns into a truth that um, turns into peace down the line, um, turns into like a lesson learned, um, a new like brick burned. Um, and so I think that those moments where I can breathe and finally accept that like I've learned a lot from this situation and I've unpacked a certain trauma that I've been trying to understand for years. I think those are the moments that I feel peace or something close to peace. Um, and I think also just the fact that the truth is now in the air and exists, um, I think is very important. And like, sometimes like the truth, the, the illusions in the society we live in um, kind of like silence a lot of those truths and make them seem like they don't exist and make them those truths inaccessible for a lot of people. And so I feel like like being able to make something that brings that to light so that somebody else can can see that light and learn something about themselves differently, I feel like is also something that I feel like is a form of like peace or at least like passing that peace to somebody else, if that makes any sense. But um, I don't know who hasn't gone. Um, uh, does anybody? Oh, it's beautiful, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Yeah, I think everyone went. Um, I just want to say, like, Usually like the last panel, I did a couple of like recaps, but y'all just going and going. I didn't want to like interrupt and like 
say anything else but what i heard from before uh talk a lot about like our existence and like how like as individuals and artists and creatives like we're, we're tied to, to tied to our existence like our humanity and i think someone said it before about like not giving someone like their humanity because they're always in control of it but also like paying tribute to someone and like um going back to your, your your connections and your roots also and like having that type of existence and creativity um i think someone said before about like erasure and that's like a really big thing like in our country like you see a lot of like marginalized c uh, creatives like trying to you know get back that erasure and understanding their roots and like having their existence and their identity and like really giving to an audience that like what you just said doesn't like see their pain as real fucking shit. Like a lot of times people underestimate our pain and don't like validate it, but it's not there for you to, you know, validate. It's there because it's there. And if we say our pain is real, then it's real. Um, I thought that was a really good point. And a lot of times in like artistic fields, you know, like we have to always validate, validate because people want to like perceive our art in a ways that, you know, it isn't like what it's supposed to be. But I really admire all of you guys talking about your piece and um, how that like means for you and your healing process, or even if it's not a healing process, like, going through pain while even trying to find heal, um, healing and um, being artistic. But moving forward in our conversation, I know some, a couple of artists like submitted a few artwork and we wanted to kind of open it up in a discussion for you guys and um, not really like, critique the art, but just kind of like if the artist sees their art on, on the screen, just giving an understanding of like why you created this piece and what that healing means for you. Yeah, and we also want this to be a conversation style. So if you have any questions for the artist, um, we like, feel free to ask and if you want to answer feel free to answer um nothing is demanded of you um but yeah we just want this to be a, a place for you to showcase your work um and then talk about what it means a little bit um yeah so this one's mine um i made this uh, um, this shirt design um, for missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, I first did like the design on the front several, several years ago um, before there was a lot of um, imagery associated with um, the MMIW movement. Um, and now it's a little bit more like a ha red handprint on um, a woman's face. But at the time there wasn't really a lot of imagery, um, which is why I kind of went with this. Um, and then the back of the shirt, I wanted to sort of like switch back and forth between like statistics of um, violence faced by indigenous women. And then also like, I guess, contrasting it with the way that like women are, I guess, um, held like within the community, like properly, like being loved in the community and important in the community. And then, um, we, um, so I designed these for the native club on my, um, at my school and we sold them and we were able to um, raise money for organizations that are helping with the issue. Yeah, so if we could go to the next slide. Oh. Oh, sorry. Actually, I want to. If anyone had any questions for Ashanti. I just want to say I love it. <laughs> I think it's amazing work. Thank you. All right, um, I think we can switch it now. Okay, so um, this was at the summit, I think, in the Denver, am I right? Was Denver the city? Uh, no, it was in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas, okay, got it. And, and you don't see the whole painting, but it shows uh, Muhammad Ali uh, like hitting really hard that punching bag that has names uh, that we all want to punch. Uh, the NRA, LaPierre, Mitch McConnell, and I don't remember who else, gun violence. But um, the, the main, um, the best part of this piece of art is that it doesn't exist anymore. I spend hours 
um, right there live in front of the kids making these paintings, okay? Painting the whole thing with all the details, uh, hours, hours. Uh, the summit was gonna be held for two days in a row or three days in a row. And my plan was to vandalize this beautiful painting during the night. Nobody else will know this. And then the next morning, they will find out that someone vandalized the art that Manuel Oliver, Joaquin's dad, did the day before. So everybody felt like shit. And, and I wrote on it, uh, go back home, um, you suck, um, NRA is the best. A lot of anti March for Lives messages. But then the whole point was to draw over that vandalized painting and again, change the message. And that's a painting that still exists. Um, the bottom line was to give uh, a lesson of, this is how the conversation is being handling out there. And we can have that same graphic conversation through art. I have a lot of walls that I have done that have been vandalized. And guess what? Another artist will come and either erase that message or turn it into a flower or turn it into some positive things. With graphics, you can do it by painting, but we also have to do that in life because every time we say something to fix things, someone will vandalize our words. So um, it was a shame. I was pretty sad when I um, did this, like at 2 a.m. vandalizing my own painting. Um, but it was worth it because besides uh, having a lot of kids feeling bad uh, very early the next day, they were all excited uh, that same day by the end of the day. So uh, thank you for, for placing this one. I love, I love this piece of art that doesn't exist anymore. So uh, nobody can have it. <laughs> yeah, I was actually really fortunate to be at that summit and um, watch you make um, that piece of art, uh, Manuel. And it was really awesome because uh, this was our first summit as March for Our Lives. And so we had hundreds and hundreds of us all over the country, like in the same room for the first time and forever, really. Right. Um, and so you're watching you do your painting and your art, it was kind of like a representation of just the momentum we were feeling, the energy we were feeling. We were like, we were together and we felt powerful and there was your painting to show for it. And then, you know, we came back the next day and it was vandalized and it was like heartbreaking because, you know, this is stuff that we really are dealing with when we go back home too. And like in our right. activism life, we are getting that hate and we are going through, um, those emotions and then for you to come back and just like make the painting even better that was just like yeah that's what we're about we're March for our lives we do great work and when pu people push back we push back even harder and we continue our fight and we continue to go and it was crazy to see that evolution through your painting and for you to be able to tell that story so vividly um, and engage all of us in that way and guide us through those emotions I thought it was beautiful and wonderful so thank you no thank you we fix things that's the point we fix we're going to fix the country we're going to fix the nation we're going to fix whatever is wrong and 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 i just fix that painting which is easy the hard part is what we're doing now would anyone else like to comment I, I do want to say one thing. I remember I was also fortunate enough to be there and I remember the the chatter, the chatter of all of the people that came in that morning and see it, seeing it all vandalized. And I think there was disappointment in the air, but there was also this sense of this has happened to us before. Like in when we fought in 2018, we were met with all of this. Like we were met with these words, we were met with these um, people who are speaking out against us. And I think 
people people were like oh how did somebody first were asking how did somebody get into the venue and um vandalize this but we're also saying um comforting each other in the sense that we get through these things like we we push through that's what we are as a movement and as a group of young people we continue to push um and we continue to fight even when everybody else is yelling at us on the other side um and i think I, I would have never thought that people would go from um, this place of sadness and perhaps it's in my own ignorance, I should have known because <laughs> um, I was one of those young people who felt that emotion. Um, but I just, I witnessed all of these people in a few moments switch from this feeling of um, anxiety of seeing that somebody was in and vandalizing to breaking through and moving forward. Um, and I think in that way, this piece of art um, represents all of those stages. It goes from the initial push to um, the moment of feeling down to getting back up again and pushing forward. Um, and I really appreciated that and witnessing it live was amazing as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we can continue. Hello, um, thank you. This is my piece. Um, I made it for an exhibition that I put together with um, a friend of mine who's also a practicing artist named Ken Cresswell. Um, it was called Tender Feral, um, which was supposed to highlight the duality that comes with being a black person where you can be radically soft and also portrayed as radically the opposite of that. Um, and so this piece came at a very intense transition period in my life. Um, I had just like left a job that I'd been in for a, a while. Um, and I had been on the brink of this like idea for this show for a long time. Um, but throughout that experience of trying to transition into that leap of faith, uh, I had a lot of moments of imposter syndrome and a lot of moments of suppression when it came to a lot of the emotions that I was feeling at the time. I felt like in the work situation that I was, I was being overworked and um, my mental health was deteriorating as a result. And I, I, was, I was suppressing this side of me that really wanted to be creating something and really wanted to act on like a what some would say like a childish whim would be um, having this idea for this show just like bubbling in my head and then also wanting to turn it into fruition but realizing the thing that's holding me back the most is the thing that's providing me money to survive um, and I feel like that's what a lot of artists are also combating during this time is just this trying to find the fine line between um, um, working toward um, stability um, and knowing that that stability can f can take the shape of different things, um, emotional stability, uh, creative stability, all these things that are nurturing uh, things for someone's well-being, um, and putting any of those on the back burner for any surface idea can be really toxic, um, especially if it's in a place where you're not really being appreciated. And I, I, as soon as I lost that job, it felt like my, my, my financial world had crumbled, but it felt like spiritually and creatively, I was like starting something new. And I, it, it was like a fall from, it felt like a very intense tower moment, which is like when, when things kind of feel like the end of the world, but it's more so an uprooting of a foundation that doesn't serve you anymore. Um, and I feel like that risk is something a lot of people of color fear. Um, as a lot of people of color have prioritized their survival over the pleasures of life, one could say, the, the things that, that make you feel more whole than just like a number or an employee and things like that. Um, and so this piece was kind of just like me unpacking that and knowing that that is an aspect of general, generational trauma that I've had to unpack for a long time, this pressure to constantly be moving, this pressure to to find places where, where you can, you have to dilute yourself to get the, the most material success. 
Um, and I, at a, since a young age, I've always known that that's not a real thing and that's not a box I need to confine myself in, but I experienced a lot of shame because of it. Um, and I think that uh, this piece kind of really ties into everything I learned through that experience where it's like, there's always going to be moments that, that like you feel like are the end of the world or, or, or hurt so much that you, you can't even believe that this could be something that's on your path, let alone be on your creative path. Um, and through that pain kind of birthing something else, um, birthing more opportunities for different types of people, stuff like that. Um, and so I, this is like, a lot of my art kind of is like this where it's like very strange and, um, Maybe until I explain it, you wouldn't specifically have what I'm saying in mind as like what you take from it. But for me, I, it's more so like kind of also trying to like capture that release and some paintings and they're on the wall right here. One of those right here and the other ones on the other wall. Um, but it, it was a very spontaneous piece and came during a very confusing time and ended up on the wall of a show that literally came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a, a moment where I felt like some true pride. And I feel like that's, that's what the process was trying to get me to. Um, but yeah. Thank you. If you have any questions. Yeah, I have, um, I have a question for you. I, I wrote it in the chat, but generational trauma is a topic we don't, we don't talk about enough, I feel like. Um, and so I would love to know from your perspective of of an artist and as you were creating this painting, what, and you don't have to go into any detail, you don't feel comfortable, but um, when confronting your generational trauma, what were, what were the steps that you took to not move past it, but I guess take it with you into this, into this piece and to, I guess, heal from it? Mm, I guess uh, uh, a level of empathy I'm trying to find with myself like a level of like understanding trying to figure out with myself through like experiences that I feel like have wronged me harmed me made me uncomfortable um and and sometimes like when you grow up I mean I feel like personally growing up like there weren't many opportunities for me to like find out why I was uncomfortable in the moments of those confrontations um and, and without the resources to even like have an idea of what those conversations could look like or what those experiences could look like, especially if they're catered to like your experience because of what you look like or who you are and what identities align with you. Like when there's no manual for that, um, the pain hits very hard um, and it can knock you down to, to points where, where sometimes you wonder like what even is the point of give, getting up if, if I'm constantly gonna be put in this cycle of, of just like, like sometimes it feels like torture to really like be existing during the time that we, we live in now, as much as it can be like a blessing and like can be a lot of privilege can come from those experiences. Like sometimes you really reach those moments where you're like, if the system is oh, gonna be built to try to destroy me at any time that I try to, I, I don't even get sometimes the chance to collect my stuff and like, get myself together um, if, if I'm not even gonna be prepared and I'm gonna be hit unexpected, unexpectedly with these kinds of experience every single time, sometimes it's like, what's the point? Um, and, and that's what not having resources can do to you. And sometimes my artwork itself is a resource, is a resource even for, for me to understand what I'm going through or a resource for me to like unpack that and, and that requires a lot of empathy and that requires a lot of patience with yourself and listening to yourself. And that's nurtured, that's really nurturing. And um, when those issues come up again and those experiences come up again, you're, you'll, you're, you're sometimes better equipped, but that doesn't mean that it gets like 10 times easier the next time. It's like a constant empathy that you have to have for yourself, that you have to build with yourself. And like if if the rest of the world doesn't show you a lot of empathy and 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 you're also being pushed to look to the rest of the world for support all the time, eventually you're gonna have to like try and come to a conclusion with yourself for how do I build that within myself 
um, in a way that like no one can take that from me. And that requires the, the horrible moments to sometimes to get to those points. And, and I, when, I when I look at this piece that I made, I don't feel sadness and I don't feel like anything traumatic rooted in it. I, I just feel like an organic process happening. Like that's like down to the green and the red, like I tried to stick to very like organic and like pure colors to me. And so this just to me seems like a process, not like anything that is concrete, but just something that is constantly happening with each like traumatic Well, I just wanted to say one thing to like your point earlier about when you first were explaining your piece and this shit is so tough, like just amazing. So I'm looking at it, um, but like you said a lot of things about like black women and like that uh, impression that we have to like, that we're always so aggressive, always so this, always so this. And we have all these narratives that we can like, you know, take it, take, take so much and be resilient and that we don't have like this ability to fall apart. And like you say, six stones and paper, I think that's really interesting. And like, my question for you is how has this piece kind of made you like shift that your that narrative for you of being black woman, of like taking all this shit that like the world society has like forced on us to just take in and really change that narrative and, and push that you can have empowerment, that you can have control. Um, and sorry to like throw so much of a big question on you, but just like how this piece really helps you like, you know, take in and reclaim like your black womanhood from before. I think they just left. Oh. I think there was some, yeah, there might be some technical difficulties, but we'll, we can come back to <laughs> Or maybe we could discuss it together. Or... Hello, sorry, technical oh, difficulties. Oh <laughs> I looked like a fool. I was like, no, my question. <laughs> no, we are in the digital age, you know. Um, but yeah, I don't know where I left off or if there are more questions, but <laughs> sorry, but that was that. Yeah, and I was just asking a question, I'll, I'll shorten it this time, but about like stick stones and paper and like black women always being seen as like really strong and taking all this shit that the world unfairly gives to us. But how has this painting that definitely while I'm looking at it is took some hard shit, like this is not gonna be, you know, the world, um, us taking that in, us like reshifting that narrative. And like, how have you been able to do that for yourself and like, well, having these pieces, like, have a message, like, how have you been, you know, embody what you're preaching through the messages of your paintings, I guess? Um, well, I, I think that it, it kind of goes back to, like, what I was saying before about, like, kind of have to, kind of being have to, having to rebuild your foundation from scratch, and I feel like a lot of, um, black women like black femmes like i think now is more than a time more of a time than ever to look at you the structures you've been forced to live under and like rethinking your place in them and and reorienting them so you can actually pursue happiness genuinely and and you wouldn't think that that would have to be like a sacrifice that people have to make but a lot of people like lose touch with the people that they care about the most their support systems their loved ones things like that, just embracing their fullest potential. Like, I'm like constantly reminded, like, like I'm Haitian, like I grew up in a Haitian household, like the values of somebody who's w grown up in such a, tr with such a traditional way of looking at the world is gonna be completely different than mine. And that's gonna bring up some, some issues in the relationships that I have with some people. It's gonna call into question, like what I wanna sacrifice in order to feel like myself and in, in order to feel happy and feel understood by myself at least before I try to find other people to understand me. Like, I think that that's like, sometimes the thing that like, like black women in particular, like they just need someone who understands, they need a space where they're understood and heard and listened to. And a lot of the, the spaces and experiences that we grow up through are not experiences where we find that and so like imagine trying to group find that your whole life in places that don't provide that for you and constantly being let down like what that does to your self-esteem and what that does to your path in life because then at some point like 
whether you hold those values or not in your head, they're gonna be conditioned as like the voices, the little voice that you hear of doubt anytime you try to reach for anything good. There's always that little voice and like, some people can blame themselves for that little voice, but most of the time that little voice isn't even like their own, that it's, it's not even them. It's, it's things that they've been taught and, and told their entire life. And so dismantling that I feel like is really important. And I think my biggest thing right now is just like realizing that sometimes you gotta be the one to do it. Like you can't just like wait for other people to do it. Like sometimes you have to create that representation yourself and that can be a very laborious thing and can be a very painful thing at times. Um, especially if you're an empath, like these past few days in the quarantine have been really hard for me. Um, but it's also knowing that makes me motivated to continue making things um, and more than ever now, so. Um, I just wanna say this goes for everyone, but especially for you, um, y'all, we are our ancestors' <clears throat> wildest dreams. Like even if you, I think especially for you growing up in a Haitian culture and background, thinking back to, you know, our our ancestors and and our family members wanting to be free to create, wanting to live a, a free life and um, experience the things that we're experiencing now. I I salute you, and I think that that is incredible that you are making art and pushing against what you have been. Um, what you could have been conditioned to believe about yourself and for giving a voice to so many other people that didn't know that they had permission to do the same. So thank you. I also wanted to speak kind of further to that, um, that experience of being black and woman. I think there's always this expectation that we are supposed to be strong, which I, I mean, we, a lot of people understand that, that strong black woman character trope, but I think we have to think about the physical uh, like what that physically looks like. It's really like mutilating our bodies um, and forcing ourselves to carry the weight of systemic oppression in the forms of racism and sexism, misogynoir. Um, and so being an artist, I think allows you to be vulnerable enough to stand up. Even though we, we might think of like being strong as standing up, I think being strong for a black woman is, is having to kind of mutilate yourself and make yourself smaller. Um, but when you're an artist, you are allowing yourself to say that the things that are in my mind and in my soul are worth being shown and they're worth being displayed um, and they're worth making real. Um, and so, yeah, I think just art, being an artist and, a, and being black and being woman is a revolutionary thing. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you for coming to the talk. <laughs> Great period, too. Who is next for the other? Yay. Um, wow, okay, so this piece, this was an accident. Um, sometimes when I'm in the middle of like portrait photo shoots or something, I'll ask someone to do something funky with their hands. Um, I for some reason have always been drawn to hands and magic that we carry within us to create. Um, and this was just something that I was like, hey, can you put your thumbs together? However, you know, you see fit. And um, she did, and she did it so beautifully. And like I was saying earlier about peace coming to me, like if it's before or after the art is made for this, it was after. Um, a lot of the times I don't really know what I'm going in for. Uh, I don't have like a crazy vision of like, okay, this is what I want to create. This is what I want to portray. Um, a lot of the times accidental photos like these just come to be. And um, this photo to me represents healing in the greatest sense and force. Um, healing from the magic that comes within our hands and what we can, we can bring to ourselves and how we can, um, we can hold healing and we can give it out. So yeah, this piece is really special to me. Um, I have it printed in three different areas of my home. Um, I don't know why they all ended up here, but they did. And it's very, very cool. 
Um, it's actually the piece that people see when they go to my website and it's the piece that when people come over and they spot it, they always have something to say about it or they, they, they feel a certain way. And I think that is, is really cool. Um, this is probably one of my favorite photographs I've ever taken and it's really special to me and I really love it. So you named your photos? Um, I did. So this one, I actually named it to, to send it in. So this is just a piece on healing and um, yeah, there she is. <laughs> I'd love to know how it makes you guys feel. Hmm. I love it. I like it a lot. Um, very spontaneous. I like that. It's not, uh, you can tell that it's not, you can tell that it's not, it's a nice mistake. Um, you. It's, a, it's a beautiful moment. So I guess uh, you were talented and lucky at the same time, right? <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was a time. I appreciate it. Yeah, for me, the initial thing that I kind of take away from this and looking at it is comfort. You know, that's what it, the feeling is. And I don't know if it's like it reminds me of, you know, a mother's hand or, you know, just somebody that you know that can, I don't know, it just reminds me of some, when you're having a rough time, it's somebody that can be there for you. And that's kind of the way it makes me feel. That's so awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Seriously, um, I hope, is it okay if I say like two more things about it, about the piece? So when you were saying that, Gracie, um, something I have written down in my notes, cause you know, my brain's a little scattered. So I always wanna keep notes, but um, for me, I'm learning a lot now in this weird transitional time of my life of, um, you know, if later on down the road, if I want to be a mother or if that's something that I can even like do and um, my own personal, you know, health issues that might prevent me from being a mom someday um, or, or carrying my own children uh, has been a very interesting thing I've been wrestling with. And so through some time and some, just some moments of silence, I've, I've learned that my art can, can be my children. And like when I create things, um, it sometimes it feels like a birth, you know, it's emotional, it's painful, it's hard. Um, and then I want to advocate for my art. I want to make sure that it's, you know, given the best, you know, if it's editing or if it's styling or whatever, it's given the best opportunity to be exactly what it was meant to be. Kind of like if I were to have kids, like how I would want to advocate for them. Um, and so it's been very fascinating and very fun to mother my, my work and to nurture it the best that I can and create things um, that can, I don't know, that can speak to people and and kind of live outside of myself you know so it's very cool that you said that it reminded you of like a comforting mother because that just that means a lot to me so thank you for sharing that i wanted to um say i feel like i love that also by the way like i love that conversation around like it feeling like a like a birth because i feel like even when i'm done when i'm done with my most like intense tedious projects or when I feel like like directly after I feel like I'm mourning something and then after that I feel like I'm a whole new person and so sometimes it even feels like a rebirth of yourself mm -hmm. and I wonder if like that's something you experience or like do you feel, feel that fatigue and then feel that labor and then you're like brand new shiny <laughs> yeah um for sure I think for certain pieces, um, something like this, especially because originally it was like the full person and then her hands and then I, I was able to crop it. Something like this that was an accidental creation. It, it felt like a, a rebirth of myself, but there was no crazy fatigue afterwards. But I have other pieces that, that usually revolve around music um, because music everyone is moving around it's really hard to get a photo and so if I am able to snap a moment in time of anything and it and it speaks something other than this is a person performing um I feel like that for me is that's a birth that that is something because it's no longer it's my art is never about me um 
and especially in, in music photography, I have found that I can take a part of someone else and give them whatever I have to give them. And, and we create this beautiful art piece together and, and they're the ones doing some of the work. And then I'm the one that's like pushing it out into, into the world, I guess. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like conception, I guess, but it's, yeah, I do feel fatigue after creating something that has someone else attached to it and how they're being represented, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for asking. Awesome, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so this is the piece that I was talking about earlier. Um, it's a mod Aubrey. Um, the background, I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, I can see it because it's kind of small um, from my phone, but it says justice for a mod in the back. Um, and it's really like, I think it was kind of um, shocking to have been like asked, asked to be a part of this, which is because I have not like, like expressed myself through art in what seems like a long time, like this was one of the first pieces that I kind of went back to doing. Um, and so it's, as I said, it was kind of like creating different pieces in Illustrator and different layers um, to kind of it, oh, show his face. Um, and I don't know if we have audio, but, um, in the background of it is me reading um, what's on those slides. Um, and yeah, it was really a process of seeing like different facets of just like shapes that by themselves look like absolutely nothing come together and create this beautiful image. Um, and I really kind of wanted to reference uh, this idea that I had heard from kind of two different places. I recently heard this quote and it was, uh, the, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Um, and so I was kind of trying to create a piece that was fraught between um, like a beautiful image um, and also a, like, you know, a story that is absolutely like horrific. Something that like, that you would never want to like look at for too long or relish in. Um, there's also this uh, concept within photography, I think it was Susan Sontag that, that came up with it, that, um, that social documentary photography should create this necessary tension between, yeah, beauty and, and like disgust. Like you should kind of, the, the, the aesthetic value of an image should draw you towards it, but then that, the story and the concept behind what you're documenting should also disgust people. But in that mixture of disgust and ad admiration, you should be convicted to act upon something. And so really writing that, um, that poem that is associated with it, which again, you can't, you can't hear it, but um, I really tried to capture vignettes. That's, that's what I really admire about storytelling is you can capture like a snapshot moment um, which I also engage in photography um, as, as part of my practice. And so being able to capture like this decisive moment um, that's very visceral and that's very beautiful um, and catches the eye. Um, and then also in a way is absolutely universal because I, I know probably, or most of us probably, um, I don't want to be able to, that's problematic, hold on. Um, I think a lot of us, uh, even if you haven't actually jogged before, have had that experience of feeling just like freedom, like there's like wind in your face or around you and you're just like kind of navigating the world on your own accord um, and kind of having this autonomy of, of what you decide to do in those moments. And you can slow down, you can speed up, you can just like look everywhere at once and you're really taking in scenery. Um, and then I kind of wanted to, to depict the fact that as 
uh, Maude Arbery, you know, a, a black body or a black person in America, a black man in America, those moments can be so quickly stolen from you um, by systems that have existed before you were born and will likely uh, exist after you're gone. Um, and yeah, so I don't know that those were the things that were going through my mind as I created this piece. Um, and it was also kind of a, a, a trial run because I had never used Illustrator before and it is not intuitive at all. So kind of looking at this image and like trying to create this image um, through a bunch of trial and error and like a lot of command Z. Um, but yeah, this is, this is how it turned out to make a long story short. Well, I have a question for you. Um, I know like in the beginning of like your explanation, first of all, this is beautiful. Like just completely, just like knowing the times and how like recent this is, it just really like brings like that disgust in you, like you said, because of like white supremacy and like the fucking like, it literally took media to bring attention. You know what I mean? And like that, the quick reaction of media and like that unifying like disgust. But I guess my question is like always taking black aesthetics and um, like intersecting it with trauma and that people always have this misconception of black art to always be filled with, and saturated with like trauma, trauma, trauma. And like, as an artist, do you think that when you're trying to make these messages, do you think that you might be re-traumatizing yourself by staring into Ahmad's face, um, recreating this message and saying, you know, like black men need to be respected. Do you think that like that also deteriorates like yourself and you talked about like black bodies, black woman bodies also going underneath the stress and uh, of racism. Um, how do you have all this entire like the, this circle of connection between like your art, your trauma and like also like not really traumatizing yourself in like what you want to produce because you have a message. But it's just it's so fucking tiring. You know what I mean? Because it's like it just keeps chasing itself. But how do you like, like take care of your body while also like having these messages and advocating for something that you definitely believe in? I think it's a process of not allowing yourself to see Ahmad only as like this victim and this person that was lynched on on camera and and whose video has been you know mass produced and, and seen by so many people to not to, to mean allow yourself to feel like this is a human being outside of any event that just that any you know awful event that has occurred um, and that has the violence that has occurred against his body. Um, but this is like a, a human being. And so recognizing the experiences that are inherent to that humanness um, and not allowing yourself to see this person that only as trauma. I think that's kind of one of the goals or like one of the, the outcomes of mass media and, and recreating this image or, you know, this graduation photo that the image that it originally came from um, in so many places is that you detach yourself from his personhood um, but as long as you are allowing yourself to stay connected to that personhood, I don't think it's a traumatizing experience at all. I think it's actually very beautiful. I um, I want to say something here. Um, I love it. I think it's a great portrait. And and I Manuel, actually yes. would you mind if we actually played the video with audio? Sure, first? I will love. Yes, please. Ahmad deserves more. He deserves more than white terrorist excuses for violence against black bodies, more than people trying to randomize his murder as if it weren't hatefully contrived, as if his blackness wasn't the only qualification that Travis and Gregory and McMichael were looking for when they stole his life. He deserves more than being blamed for his own death. When you say he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, or he should have stopped running if he weren't guilty, what you really mean is that he shouldn't have been so black and so breathing. Surely that could have saved him. Surely if his brown eyes weren't so gentle and his friends so serene, his blood would still be in his veins and not played so insolently across Blackwood asphalt. Yet no matter how many excuses you make, he will always deserve more. More time and more laughs and more love and more respect and more justice than this world will ever let him have. For that, no excuse can be made. Rest in power, Ahmaud Arbery. 
Awesome. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we were missing now. Now we got the whole picture and it's great. Um, I, but what, what I was going to say is that um, the reason why I probably connect with this is because this is exactly what, what uh, Joaquin went through, right? And, and I decided to use Joaquin's image. But the thing is, and this is kind of an invitation for you to, that you started it this with the poetry and the music to give him through art the chance to raise his voice like um there's many images of Joaquin doing things that he actually wasn't able to do while he was alive I made him do those things so um I think that you have a whole project here you don't have one piece of art. You have a whole project that could become in a new way of, of uh, uh, not only African-Americans and, and, and him in particular to, to raise voices in a crazy way. I mean, all the things that you mentioned that he won't be able to do, all the things that he doesn't deserve, uh, he should be running and he should be having fun and partying and singing and dancing. And you can make that happen. You can give us those images and 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 give that present of continue living and and fighting. Uh, only art can do that, and I and I would love to see more from you um, and this guy together. Thank you so much. That's that's a very beautiful concept that people can live on through creations. Um, yeah, that I absolutely agree with. I feel like some of the hardest aspects of like seeing black death in media is just the injustice. I feel like that's the most terrifying part of 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 living your life as a black person and fearing that it could be taken away from you at any moment is just that level of injustice and like the impermanence and like the disposability that they put on you and your existence and your feelings and if you put uh, so much hard work into the life that you've built for yourself, that injustice feels even more terrifying and it's even more uncomfortable to sit with. The fact I that- think, Yeah. Oh. Also, I, I kind of like to that, to your point as well, I think that I remember seeing this image, this photo, like graduation photo or a senior portrait or whatever it is um, and, and thinking like, wow, at least they use like a good picture because it's so often that like the pictures that are associated with our lives and with our deaths in when it, they're, we're placed in, in mass media is like, they'll use some picture that is supposed to be like, ant, like I don't know, this supposed to be like a bad picture of you. Um, I've, I've obviously we don't wanna like adhere to respectability politics in such a way that one image of you will forever define your, your personhood or humanity, but um, that's definitely what the case is when our lives are seen as so disposable um, and when our like being can be like summarized into like a single video. Like, yeah, I agree. Like, isn't it absolutely crazy that black people, like, I feel like for me, like over time, like when I was younger, I used to be scared of dying. And then like at some point in adulthood, it wasn't really the fear of dying itself. It's just more so the process of like who that control is in the hands of and, and seeing like the systems that we exist in every day and how that control can be even in their hands. It makes nowhere feel really safe. And I feel like I, I, have, the, I have the feeling that that's changing now with, with the youth, okay? Um, I'm a Latino. I don't represent myself as a Latino since I lost Joaquin. And, and this leader that we have, he keeps on talking shit about us as, as the problem itself. Like, like if we get out of this country, which I won't because I'm an American citizen now, so fuck him. I'm gonna stay on this side of the wall. Uh, like if that's gonna solve the problem and it's not. But the point is that I see the youth thinking as humans. I see you guys thinking as humans. 
and I and and that's that's a plus. And and you will see that change in the next 10 to 15 years when no one is concerned about the color of your skin, hopefully, okay? But hopefully, and with the help of us doing what we do today, um, being inclusive is something that I see now happening. It's it's a cool thing. Uh, these two guys, the, the white supremacists, and, and that, that's not cool. It's not the cool thing and it's gonna be out. So I don't, we don't have that answer now and I'm not telling you that it's happening now, but I do have the feeling that we're getting there thanks to what you guys are doing. And again, I feel like um, I'm not anymore only a Latino since, I, since all the tragedy touched my house. Now I feel that I belong to a group that is beyond that. And we're all together here. And I gotta go there and fight for black women. And I want you to fight for Latinos and Mexicans. And, and that is actually our, our most powerful tool. The way that we respect each other and empower each other because they don't know how to do that. They won't mix with anyone. They think they have already like a, not a lot of born uh, power and it's bullshit. You, you hear me here, like we have, we have the answer for our own questions and concerns. I feel like we do have the answer and I feel like we've always really had the answer like deep down. I think that's not even anything I'm concerned about. I feel like as like generations get like the younger generations get more of a platform to talk, I feel less scared about that responsibility going into Correct. their hands as they're looking at the world in a different way. I'm more so terrified of the ways that we are slowly trying to destroy some of these systems that we're, that are harming us and the people who with the most power in those systems are slowly starting to rebuild them in different ways. And I feel like that's something I felt even during like social distancing, like so much of the contradictory information from the people who are supposed to be like extending the resources to help us and like the difference in dialogue happening there versus the dialogue that I'm having with like, or I'm just seeing between like people who are like 16 on like Twitter, just talking about all this politics is gonna affect them for the rest of their life. And like, there's a lot of power to that voice, but in terms of it being listened to, I feel like is the biggest issue and we can make a bigger uproar. I feel like we can mm -hmm. continue to make a bigger uproar always, but- We have to, and we have to be very offended. And, and, and I don't see people offended enough. I'm always- And I, I, I know, I know you are offended and I can tell, <laughs> but I don't see enough people offended. I live in a community that had a mass, uh, uh, had a shooting inside, the, the main school of it to less than a little more than two years ago. And life is normal in here. We have the same mayor. We have the same, we have the same everything. I go out there and they look at me, oh, that's wax that. So this community is not offended enough. Your community is not offended enough. And we have to really be offended. And we use art to show that we're offended. So our art should also beyond giving us peace and all that, it should offend and impact people. Fuck it. We have a talent and a skill. If we don't use it, then we're selfish. We have to use our talent and skills to help others. And, and, and in those others, sadly but true, my son is not part of those others. I wish I knew this. I wish I'd had this conversation before February 14th, but I did it, but I'm having it tonight. So I can save someone tomorrow. Be fucking offended and, and learn how to draw being offended and place it everywhere. We're gonna win this. I am sure you're gonna have a different future, a total different nation. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you so much for your, um, thoughts, um, and, like, for this conversation, this is going really great, um, it's going so amazing that we're actually, like, um, running a little bit behind, um, we do have to end in, like, 25 minutes, and I want to make sure we get to everyone's art pieces, and everyone gets a chance to, um, amplify their art, 
Um, so uh, I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, this is my piece and the lovely Manuel happened to be in California and he was so generous to come out and support me and help me with this. Um, and it was from the Tom's End Gun Violence Together campaign. And the concept behind this um, is it's a little girl in a bulletproof vest painting the peace sign hand, which kind of represents the future she envisions for herself. And I feel like the meaning and the metaphor behind this is that, you know, whether it be our legislators, those in power tell us that, um, you know, that watered down colors in black and white is the most vibrant that we're allowed to have. Um, and I feel like that's why all my art um, is so colorful is because I feel like, you know, using these bright colors is an act of resistance and saying that there's more. And like, you know, when you think of colors, you can't describe them unless you have seen them. And I think they represent the freedom that we um, and so many people more than I have been denied freedom and color and vibrance and beauty and, and safety. And, and we're told that they don't exist and they're not real or that they're at capacity and there's no more, there's no more brightness and vibrance. Um, and I feel like, you know, a little girl painting this hand, children have the ability to dream and imagine beyond what we tell them the limits are. Um, and that's, you know, through their imaginations. And, and I hope that all of us and I think artists are those children that grow up and are able to continue to imagine um, a greater world for ourselves and so that's you know kind of what it represents for me um is you know the contrast between what we're living and what we could potentially have and what is able to exist i really liked um that part where you said um you can't describe a color unless you've seen it um, and it really reminded me of this quote that i heard from either it was yara Shahida or as amanda gorman um, and it was talking about how activists, as activists, our job is to fight for something that we have only really seen in our mind's eye. And um, I would love it if you could like speak to that, that idea that activists fight for something that they've only really imagined. Um, yeah. Well, that's kind of something um, that I've tapped into through, you talked about doing portraiture. And I think, you know, when, we are artists drawing portraiture of people who have been murdered, especially people who we've never met. Um, we feel connected to them in some way. And that is our imagination telling us who these people were. Um, and you can see it in their faces, in their physical features. Um, you know, I. I've had dreams about the people that I've drawn, you know, talking to me and be, being physically present with them. Um, and I've never met them in my life. And I think that's something that we tap into. Um, and Manny, unfortunately, doesn't tap into because he knows Joaquin. He's the father of Joaquin, but the rest of us did not get the privilege to know Joaquin. And so we have to try as hard as we can to know them and, and know their story even though we can't be present with them and that's something you know that I try to tap into and it's hard you know for especially recently with Ahmad um, and with Brianna um, but it doesn't do them justice if we don't if we don't try to know them um, so yeah <laughs> I guess if there's no other questions or comments, we can move to the next person. 
Matthew? So um, this is a piece I did recently um, where I was exploring these um, things that held me down. Um, these systems of oppression and homophobia and racism and these things that um, I faced kind of every day through my life. And um, I, I was in this, this dark place. I took uh, a picture of myself pulling out my hair and I, I decided to draw it and draw um, the emotions I was feeling. Um, and these hands pushing are um, these, these symbols of these systems. And so I was kind of trying to figure out why, why do people of color, why do people who are oppressed have to rip open um, this darkness around them? I was trying to um, figure out why it was my job or why it felt like it was my job to break down the systems of oppression around me. Um, because often I feel like we are put into these spaces where, um, or I was put into these spaces where I was the person being asked to break down the system or I was the person being asked, um, like as a person of color, does this offend you? Can we tokenize you and use you? Um, can we place you on a pedestal and use you as a speaker? Um, and I felt like it shouldn't be my responsibility. And so this piece called responsibility um, is kind of a symbol of all of those things and all of those emotions. And I, I decided to use um, this wonderful medium embossing powder um, over a black sheet of paper because I truly wanted to explore the contrast um, between these ideas, this idea of hope and ripping through um, and these systems around us that oppress. Um, and this is part of a series, a part of nine. And um, in the last one, it's, it's me sitting on top of my, on top of my work um, with a megaphone to show that I've, I've grown to understand these systems of oppression and grown to see the um, groups of people who fight along each other, alongside each other. And I think it, it kind of goes back to what Manny was saying, this, this nature of solidarity and showing up for each other um, and truly growing with each other and trying to dismantle these systems that oppress um, and dismantle these systems that put us in danger. And I think this, like, this piece was at the beginning of this series and this beginning of exploration. Um, and I really enjoyed kind of looking back on it and deciding to put it in here because I think from all of your work, I've seen um, this pain, but also this reflection of hope. Um, like in Gracie's, I saw a lot of hope. Um, and I think like we as artists, our purpose is to help create hope, but also to explore our own trauma. And, um, and personally, that's how I have always viewed art, um, is exploring my own personal trauma to um, help create hope for others. And this piece, I was somewhat selfish in the sense that it's purely about me, but part of art is making sure that you are healthy and exploring your own emotion and making sure that you are able to communicate effectively um, what you are feeling in a moment. Um, so yeah, that's what this piece is. I have a question. While you were exploring like, um, like your trauma, things like that, what did that make you realize about yourself as an artist, like your exploration? Yeah, so I think I, this was one of the the first pieces where I, I truly, often the way my art works is I, I kind of create it on a whim. Um, it just, it comes to me and it's created. And this was, this was kind of one of those pieces I woke up um, with the dream of doing this piece. It was like, I was struggling the night before and woke up with the idea. Um, but I took my time. I took my time to reflect internally on what this piece would mean to me before it was created and I don't necessarily think you do that with every piece but this one in particular I wanted to explore why I was feeling this way and also how I could communicate what I was feeling for others um, and I think what I kind of found in myself was um, 
that like these are systems that push us down but we have the power to stand up and it's not easy and we can't do it alone <laughs> but um i think there are times where we have to speak up um for what we believe in and this was at a point where i was kind of struggling with um not do i sit and be quiet but is it my place is it my place to dismantle is it my place to be in this um because i knew it affected me but sometimes it feels like all of your power is taken away um and so i think within myself i found that power and that power to rip through um and also to not be afraid to ask others to pick you up because um in drawing these hands out i I realize that it goes both ways. There are these hands that push us down, but there are also these hands that reach out to us. Um, and I, I've always struggled with connecting with people. And I think this piece was a way to explore um, connection and a way to explore asking for help and asking for others to help pick you up. Um, it's raining very hard in my corner all of a sudden, which is great um, to accompany this ambiance. Um, but I wanted to ask, I guess, in terms of like what you said about like, even sometimes not feeling like you belong in the process of that healing. Um, it makes me think a lot about like imposter syndrome and how a lot of artists like reach a point where even in their own practice, they're like, do I even belong here? Is any of this real? Why am I even pursuing art when I could, like, it's like this whole existential crisis that comes right when you're at the brink of like creating something really wonderful and really important. Um, and I guess it just makes me think of like what your relationship with imposter syndrome has been and, and also applauding that message of like not being afraid to ask for help because sometimes that self doubt is just an example of how deep rooted this shit is like to where even when you're doing something to help your community, you feel like you don't belong in it. Like you don't belong in that practice. And, and so I just want to hear more about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I, so I grew up in Texas. I grew up in a like super conservative household. <laughs> um, so I guess in some ways I was kind of radicalized and awakened um, through high school and meeting new people and exploring um, new opportunities and new rooms, rooms that I had never been in before. Um, and I, I would walk into these spaces and I would feel undeserving of the opportunity or I just like, I didn't fit there. like the like pure like pure what impurity and what imposter syndrome is it's like you enter these rooms and you feel out of place in its entirety but more importantly i think you feel like you just you don't deserve it <laughs> um and you don't deserve to sit and speak on your trauma and speak on what you felt and offer the solutions that you have come up with and i think over time and especially with my journey in the advocacy space, I've, I've learned that you, you have to push that feeling down and it makes you a little bit uncomfortable and it, you feel out of place. And I think there's something kind of good about feeling a little bit out of place because it shows that you are somebody powerful and different um, and willing to speak up for what you believe in. But I, I also think, like you said, reaching out for help is um, how you also feel like you are deserving of what um, you've received or the opportunity you've had because I, I never really felt in place until I made friends in the community I was in. Um, and after meeting these people and feeling appreciated in the work I was doing and um, the things I was saying, it became clear to me that uh, I can feel uncomfortable and feel like I belong. Um, and there's a lot of power in that and there's a lot of beauty in that and being able to sit in a room knowing that you're supported, um, but also just a bit on your seat uncomfortable because of the thing you're about to say that will definitely shake the room a little bit, but you know it's your place to shake that room um, and you know it's your place to dismantle that. And I think that's, I guess imposter syndrome is in one way 
a terrible thing because I think, especially in communities of color um, in minorities where we always kind of feel out of place, it's because of the systems that are set around us. They were um, created to discriminate in their foundation. So they will never respect um, us in that way. Um, but I think, Part of imposter syndrome is learning and growing and finding people that can help support you. And I think um, that's truly the beauty of being able to sit in a room and feel appreciated. And it's needed, it's needed, all of us need it. And I think this is one of those rooms where we're all kind of on the edge of our seats, but we know that we deserve to be here. Now, I think some, something that I kind of, that. I thought of as you were speaking about like physical spaces and rooms that we feel like we're not supposed to be in. Um, what is the most interesting is that oftentimes the, the people who physically built those rooms that we feel like we're not supposed to be in are our ancestors. They're uh, people of color and uh, black and indigenous folks that literally whose hands built those rooms and then we come and feel like we are not supposed to be there, but we are the exact people that should be there. Um, and then it also thought, made me think of the Lilia Watson quote, or Lila Watson, I always get it wrong, but um, the quote that um, don't, is like, don't come here if you're here to help me, come here because you know that um, our liberation is bound together or like my liberation is bound up in yours. Um, and so always feeling like you do definitely belong in any space where you're fighting for liberation because our liberation is collective. Um, and it's not, yeah, it's not bound to one specific group or one specific person, but we're all fighting for our collective liberation. I have nothing to add to that. I think it sums up <laughs> this whole wonderful conversation. I think like, it is truly like, yes, like Vikiana said, our liberation is collective, repeating that over and over and knowing that together we can do it and together we can work towards something and not necessarily sharing our trauma or pretending that we know each other's trauma, but understanding that what we are fighting for and what we are attempting to dismantle is collective. Like there is no question about it. We are all in it. Just so that you all know, I will use that line on a painting, okay? So <laughs> if you well, have plans for if you have plans for <laughs> copyright or any or trademark, too late. I'm gonna use that and I won't trademark or anything. We just let's start using that. It's magical. It is magical and it's like just to add on to what you were saying and to just agree and agree and agree with you and like the enemy or the people that are oppressing, you know, they're not afraid of a bunch of people, but what they are afraid of is unified people. And this is like a step into unity, you know, and this is us together collectively, like you were saying, you know, this is what changes. This is what breaks down those walls. This is what breaks down the barrier. It's the unification of saying, we might not look like each other. We not we might not believe like each other. We might, we may, we might not even be like each other in any, you know, sense of the word of, you know, what makes us, um, oh gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess like vibe or whatever. But at the end of the day, we are all human beings. We are all a part of this human race. And if we can work together and if we come together unified and with art and advocation and and with our healing, you know, that is what will change the world. And I just want to applaud all of you for your beautiful art and for, you know, contributing to this amazing thing. But yeah, I just had to say that because y'all are amazing. And, and we can be the others, by the way, because we're artists. We, we're creative. We can get outside of our own human soul and let's try to do that homework like i want you to be a 52 year old latino tonight think about that and i'm going to be a 21 year old uh, black girl i'm going to think about that and what are my issues and my concerns and how do i put that um new attitude together and add it to my work yeah. and i'm so happy that you guys were able to like join this conversation and even just take time because like time is so valuable like 
especially now in this crazy time that we're living in, like no one fucking knows what's going on, but like we took time out to heal together, to come into this virtual space. Like we're not even here to feel each other's presence and really have a conversation, but we're doing this digitally and like really pushing through and just trying to like transition um, off the conversation, even though it's so good. Um, I just want to gauge where you guys are at, like how you're feeling, if you're feeling um, a little better coming to this conversation um, than leaving it and just like, a word that you're pulling out, a phrase or a quote that you heard from someone else. Um, just a, uh, to, oh, Robin, sorry. I, I didn't know where we were going. Um, do we have another, oh, sorry, one more person before we go. Robin, please explain your piece. And then afterwards, we'll uh, wrap up and say a quote or a phrase that we learned today um, before we transition off the call. So I tend to think the way that I view art is more experiential, meaning it's about like, observation and experience of community as a whole. So it's finding things that can create space for us because one of the biggest things that indigenous people face is erasure. And oftentimes people don't think about that because they're like, well, I see natives, like you guys are mascots. They might not even realize what they're saying and how offensive it is. <laughs> but the, when you think about it, like more people were upset that we were removed from the Land of Lakes butter box than they have ever been about missing and murdered indigenous women than they have ever been about the fact that our murder rate is 10 times the national average. Um, that women under age of 35, according to the CDC, we have a higher murder rate than any other group. We also face aggravated assault against American Indian and Alaska natives is more than twice the rate of the whole country. And you don't, people, because they don't even see us. We're not represented in larger mediums. We're completely left out of the conversation that space isn't there for us. Um, and that becomes, I, that becomes internalized in some ways because then oftentimes you're like, well, where do, like, how am I, as an indigenous person growing up in this country and seeing that where I'm left out of the space where we're not even, we're not even important enough to be collected or, considered on our own land and people I don't think understand that pain that goes into that that hurt that goes into that and then also how that changes your psyche like how it almost becomes community events are healing to me like anytime you get a group of people together and create a space for indigenous people that's healing um and Again, I always ask people, can you name five famous natives? And the first thing people want to say is they want to bring up these historical figures like Geronimo or Pocahontas. And it's like, no, that's the problem. You have to start thinking about us as now because we're current. There's natives out there doing amazing things. And yet that's never seen. That's not portrayed. The fact that a lot of people, I went to two different tribal colleges and I'm so proud of them. And yet I, and I work a lot in education advocacy and getting people involved in schools, and yet people have never heard of tribal colleges. Um, and I think, so when I'm looking at art, I'm looking at ways, one, how can we create space? How can we get people even talking about us in the first place and including us? Because that's often, again, something missing, yet we're facing dire statistics. Our suicide rate is it's, I want, it's the highest of any racial group, but it's also one of those things where I think that's correlated in, well, what am I? We don't have a space for us. We don't, we're told what indigenous is because oftentimes the few times we are like talked about in mainstream, it's in this historical sense. It's in this very like problematic playing into a trope of marginalized minority and that's one of the I think one of those things that when I'm around my people when we're in groups when we're creating stuff it that tends to go away and then we're focused on this and we're focused on having conversation and so this was we're just it started off as like how can we get a bunch of people involved in something like silly and fry bread has become such a such a staple within native diet, but it's not really one of our like sovereign foods. And so it was like, well, we can create like, and again, experiential is kind of the world that I live in. So it was, well, we can do this like massive fry bread and I, that's, you're looking at 300 pounds of dough right there. Um, 
and again, it was a way to get a lot of people involved because then suddenly people were like, well, my grandmother taught me this is how you make it. And then somebody else is like, no, no, we, we use this. And it's like, let's talk about why we use those things. Let's talk about why you feel that. And then also anytime people are bringing in recipes from their grandmothers or bringing in recipes that they've handed down, food is also a source of healing, I always feel like. Because food has roots and food is for a lot of us, that was the one thing that our parents could give us. For those of us who grow up in lower socioeconomic groups, I always remember like when I think, when I'm sad or I think fondly, I start thinking of like stews. I start thinking of breads. I start thinking of the love that my mother gave me in this form of food. And then you have, but again, there's this, because we're not really, we don't have that outside platform. Outsiders don't tend to understand like, I mean, even when we did this, there was a lot of backlash of people saying, well, like your obesity rates are insane. Your diabetes rates are insane, which is true. But the thing is by outsiders saying that they're not understanding how, why we have fry bread in the first place. It was because they came in and they burned our crops. They burned our food. They burned Buffalo. They burned any time we had farms or stuff like we would get on our feet, they would cut off our legs and they would tell us to run. And so this is the one thing that we can claim. And again, I think art for a, art is so personal and yet it's so uniting because it's one of those things that every person can create something and whether no one understands it or no one feels it, as long as you're feeling something, that's what matters. And so for me, I view the experiential part, truly the, the experience of creating something, the community space, is the true art. If I'm able to get a, a hundred indigenous people in one room, and again, we're a group that they were told, in the Declaration of Independence, 30 lines after saying, all men are created equal, it calls us merciless Indian savages. That is how far rooted anti-indigeneity in the US goes. And so when there's an act of rebellion, I feel like, and there's an act of triumph when we're able to get a bunch of natives in a room, whether it's doing something that there is no, I wouldn't say like most of my art wouldn't have permanence because there isn't like fry bread is not going to last a year from now. You can't hang this on your wall. You can't look at it, but it's that experience of like, we know all together because there's no way I could have done this on my own. There's no way two people could have lifted 300 pounds of dough. Like you have to have these community efforts to get this stuff rolling. And so when I think of art, I think of it as a way to unify. I think of it as a way to create space. And I think it's a way to start talking about which at the source, when natives are gathered and talking about stuff, that's true rebellion because for so long they've told us what our pain is. They told us how to heal. They told us to get over stuff. And I look at it like we weren't even allowed to have our own colleges till 1968. And you're gonna tell me to heal? We were the last group to get civil rights and you're gonna tell me to heal? People could still dig up our graves up until 1992 under the Grave Repatriation Act because we weren't considered people. We were these historical, like, anthropolo like anthropological like artifacts. And so by reclaiming the space, by creating stuff as a group, we're showing that we're still here, that we're still making stuff. So when I look at this and I look at all the different handprints in it, and I think of that experience, that's what that, what art means to me and what the power of what can, art can do. Um, I think it's really cool that you used um, Fry Red, especially because of how it came about, like being created out of like, rotten like shitty government commodities and then native native people like switched around and created like delicious food and like is it healthy not really but is it delicious like absolutely and like always like at like feasts and gatherings and like potlucks and stuff there's always fry red and like that's like become such like a like you were saying, like a way to bring people together. And that's like absolutely not what um, the US government was like thinking of it when they like gave native people like here, like some shitty ingredients and then like 
Native people were able to like turn around and create just like the most beautiful thing. Um, so I think that's like super powerful. That also oh, yeah. makes sense of like slavery and enslaved people. Um, it, like America loves to give oppressed groups the worst of the worst and we always continuously make it into something that is beautiful. Um, we're always artists. So thinking about like soul food, um, like chitlins, which I don't like them, but I know somebody likes them. And <laughs> we um, create create beautiful things out of um, out of the the crap that we're given, um, and that is activism. That is art. That is the resilience of us. And that's absolutely beautiful. I think that I also feel like like thank you so much for sharing with us and like going off like literally go off like beautiful um and like just thinking about how like I feel like there's a lot of people these days who are just so desensitized to these types of things that they're even willing to be like well get over it like if you wanted to truly heal you would just like get over it like even in the context of slavery being like well we're not slaves anymore so what's there to cry about and things like that and but also acknowledging the fact that like as much as like if people had a choice, I don't think that they would bind themselves to such a like a horrific in some ways like history and and sometimes it's, it's very complex to where like as a person of color as a like a black person indigenous people like you're you're bound to that history and that history becomes your only like form of validation in their eyes like the only like true like staple of your strength and like um your resilience is always trapped in that history but then they also want to be like get over it even though if we do let go of that and we do disconnect from that like what will we have here for people to look at us and like hear us and like acknowledge us and so like preserving that history i feel like is so it's 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 so important and and I thank you and I feel like indigenous people preserve it in a way that is like down to like the soil that we walk on and I and I really appreciate you sharing that with everyone. And and you can get over things that still happen, you know, like get over what I mean. I still see uh, how they treat um, your ethnic group and 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 what happens with racism here every fucking day. Um, it's even worse in what happens with the Latinos and the way they, so so it's not about getting over and moving on because I still see things happening, uh, but it is about grabbing those emotions and making sure that we, we use our talent to prevent it from keep on happening um, in the future. It's not, not necessarily in the near future, in, in the long term. Uh, because I know that somebody mentioned we are our ancestors. Yes, I agree with that, our roots. But we are also whatever comes after us. We can, we can sculpt that, um, that new um, uh, group of people that will follow me while I'm here in this life. So I got to do the best that I can. And I've seen a lot going on tonight in this meeting that I love, by the way. I could do this every night if you want. Um, I was missing this. I love it. So, um, but let's turn this into something that, yes, we're not over it, idiot. We're not over it and we won't be over it, but we will use it to make sure that someone at some point won't need to suffer that anymore. I think that's a beautiful point and like to your point Robin about like your first line was about like that erasure and like uh art literally transcends over times and it evolves and it modernizes itself and like you could literally have like colonizers could write a fucking book about what actually happened but that art that was created at that time will tell the story and no one can erase that the feeling the trauma any of that like that can't be erased and like that really puts in perspective of like healing through like food, through family, through connection, through touch, through all these different things and finding your own like identity and like your artwork. 
Um, and I know that we're over time and we're trying to wrap up real quick, but just I really want to gauge everyone's like perspectives and y'all mindsets before we let go. Um, and just like one thing that you're feeling, like if it's a word, if it's a, a phrase, like our liberations collective that we got from today, anything that you guys want to share and just like leave off with so we can kind of keep the healing going and like our conversation doesn't stop here. So the person that's next to me is Manuel Oliver. Throw it to you. Our liberation is collective. And I love that we have that. And uh, yes, let's use it and be offended and show in a huge way how offended you are. Thank you for this, by the way. I loved it. Who do you throw it to? What was that? Who do you throw it to? What am I what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Who do you throw it to? Who do you want to go next? Oh, oh, you know, I have a language barrier here. Um, who do I have next to me? I don't see the names. Hold on. Robin, you're right next to me. I feel a sense of, it's one of those like exhales, <laughs> which I don't know if it's because this has gone on for a while. And like, you know, you exhale, but at the same time, you're like, supported by other people and there's a sense of peace that i'm finding in this group but also just like the excitement of what comes next um so thank you oh um I, i'll throw it to mitsuka you're, you're next to me um uh Yesterday, uh, I did like an activity with some of my students who were, I was like going on this huge tangent as I usually go about this quote that I heard from a TV show um, on Netflix that somehow inspired my lesson because this is the life that I live. Um, I, it, it, the, the line was, this woman is explaining her process and how she sees herself as a creative even in the field of science. And she said, she was explaining what inspired her to do that and the quote that came out of her was um what brought me what brought me to a point of creativity was blank and she she inserted her own statement but I took that word out and I just kind of thought of that blank and that process like the process like what moments and feelings and experiences bring you to a point of creating something um bring you to a point of expressing something and making it tangible um like and acknowledging that process and acknowledging the, the, where we can pinpoint some of where our art comes from and like the conversations in those. And I, I just wanna honor that process, honor that like, whether it is a, a devastating experience that brings you to a point of creativity, whether that it's a joyful experience, um, an experience where you're mourning, like just honoring that and honoring that and each person who is creating something new um, and, and, and respecting that and empathizing with, with what it means to come to a point of creativity and inspiration. So I feel great, basically, <laughs> was my tangent. <laughs> um, and I'll pass it to Shanti. Um, I think I'm kind of feeling like in community, I guess, which is probably the first time I've felt like this for the last several months since we've been in quarantine. Um, and I think that's like a really like powerful thing to be able to create um, digitally. Um, and I think, I guess like sometimes just cause I have like a hard time like verbalizing the way that I feel or like the way that I think about um, my artwork or um, just like I guess like the process of creating it it was really interesting to like listen to every what everyone had to say and then I guess just like relate different things back to my own work um, and in some ways it was like really validating and then in other ways it was also really cool just to see like what everyone else is doing and um, not to feel so alone I guess which again is really nice um especially after um you know like social distancing like not being able to see people like the the feeling of like connecting um with other people has been really cool 
and um, Gracie. Um, well, the overall thing that I take away from this is it's got to happen again, because this has been, you know, I have so much to take away, honestly, and I want to continue following each one of you and, and following up with what you're doing. Um, you're also amazing and inspiring, and I feel like so often as artists, we believe what we share is only ours, like our emotions and our feelings. And we don't realize that what we're creating is a million other people's feelings as well. And I feel like um, the people watching this have so much to take away. And I have resonated with so much of what had been said um, that I just, you know, it makes me wonder what else, what other inspirational things each of you is carrying that I, will help me in um, what I am going through. So I really hope that this conversation can at some point be continued. I will pass it off to Matthew. I think to kind of, one, to just um, speak on it, I think what I've kind of explored through all of your works is like, we use the tools that we have to break down oppressive barriers. And like, I saw that in the food that you brought your community together with. I saw that in the mural. Um, and I think like that togetherness is what I'm feeling from this. And I also think something really beautiful about this conversation is even if 30 people were watching, 10, one person was watching this, it's this reality that, um, all of us grew from this by seeing each other's work and all of us felt emotions and seeing each other's work to take forward and to move forward with and to create more art with. And that's another opportunity to bring our emotions to other people and to bring our emotions to these groups. And um, I think by growing together and um, growing in power and growing collectively, um, that's how we truly can create change by helping each other develop and grow. Um, I am going to, wow, I really don't know who's left. <laughs> um, oh, Amani, are you, have you on? I don't think so. <laughs> and you're right next to me, so this works out. Um, man, first, let me just say you all are magic. Every single one of you has such, such talent and such gifts that you are all putting out into the world. And it's an honor to share this space with you. Um, I think one of my biggest takeaways from this phenomenal experience is that if your art does not make someone else uncomfortable, is it art? You know, and I, I need to ask myself that question because I think it's so easy for us to, as artists, just, and especially artists that are making money off of our art to create, to just survive, you know, and to stay in the rhythm of just making art. But if, your art isn't giving someone a weird nudge in their side, or if it isn't raising questions, you know, is it art? And so thank you all so much for challenging me and for giving me the space to exist with you. And yeah, and yeah, just thank you. Um, so since both of my people to this side of me have gone, I don't think India has gone yet. Have you gone yet? No. Okay, it's all you, boo. <laughs> Okay, so this has definitely been a, a point of reconciliation. Um, and then to agree um, with Imani, I think that, that that art is definitely a kind of representation of the dichotomy between a parade and a protest. It's like a, a parade is definitely, they're both, of course, organized and they call upon the community to come together for something. Um, but, you know, a parade is intended to be beautiful in this very intentional way. And a protest is beautiful as well, but not necessarily intentionally beautiful. It's it's asking something of someone. It's making a scene and saying, this is us and we're here and this is what we're demanding. Um, and so I think that our art is both beautiful and it demands something of the viewer. It demands something even of ourselves. Um, and it allows us to heal in these beautiful ways. And I think that this, this entire, uh, what like this conversation that we're having is absolutely, uh, an opportunity to heal with each other, um, which 
I think it, it definitely fulfilled its purpose. So, yes. <laughs> That everyone, I'm, I'm low key kind of sad to be honest. This was a really good conversation. Um, and just I'll just say a couple last things and then I'll throw it to Vicky to give our last project of just like thank you for got for showing up and like giving time, like I said before. Um, what I would say that I took from this is like art is very fluid. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm a visual artist, things like that, but just like like listening to you guys talk about how passionate about your work and like your visual representations just really like put in perspective for me that like art can really do a bunch of shit and really like let people grow and like develop and heal, so. Yeah, and uh, Vicky and Bria, thank you so much for hosting this. Thank you for putting it together. It's yeah, been so fun. Thank you so much, thank you. Like hearing how this conversation has gone has been so wonderful and just like being able to observe this and listen is, like it's gone way better than we could have like at all imagined. So thank you so much for participating in this and making this so wonderful. And we, this is what we wanted. We wanted to, to create a space where y'all felt safe enough to have these conversations. And, you know, it's great to know that like we were somewhat successful in that. We definitely, definitely want to continue in um, creating more spaces for y'all um, and, you know what, you know, hopefully this won't always be virtual um, and maybe we can meet in person someday. Maybe that would be a thing again. Um, but there are, we definitely wanna look at more ways that we can collaborate. So um, Matthew, um, he was a panelist on this call, I mean, in this conversation, but he's actually also a member of the March for Our Lives staff. And he's gonna talk a little bit about um, some ways that we'd like to stay involved with you and a little project that we'd like to um, involve um, to work with on all of you with um, for future uh, remix sessions. So I'm just gonna kick it off to him. Yeah, so um, Gabby, if you could project. Um, so this is the, these are the, if you've seen the March for Our Lives logo, they are my rendition of the four people. The, we have four people who um, are these icons. Um, and they're only icons, they're limited by that. And I wanted to visualize those people for Remix and for this series of videos we're doing. Um, something that I wanna challenge all of you with, if you have the capacity, space, time, um, and resources to do is to um, either reimagine these four people um, and create your own piece from them or to um, paint in the background of these four people and we'll send this file around or um, color in these four people, whatever you need to do to get your creativity out. Um, and what we'd like to do with that is to um, compile them all together. If you remember at the very beginning of the video or at the very beginning of this, um, we had a small intro video um, and we want to start using our own art together, our collective art um, as the brand of Remix because that is truly what Remix is. It is us using our collective intellect and power to um, dismantle and to advocate. So um, we will send this around after this call and we will post it on our social media for um, our follow followers to also contribute, but I'd love if um, you would also be a part of this. Um, additionally, I think we're all going to stay connected as a community of artists. Um, I think that's so important, especially in this space, is just to remember to um, stay connected. So I think somebody said it, but put your at in the chat that way Marge can follow you and that way we can all follow you um, collectively together. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Safe, stay healthy. Bye. Bye. Thank you.